Good evening, it's Eric Erickson here, 9 after the hour. I am back in Atlanta. It is blue skies and nice. Um, the weather in New York was great, but I'm glad to be home. And we got a lot of news to cover this evening, including the National Rifle Association coming out with a position on bump stocks, among other things. New details about the shooter as well. We'll get into all of those and the political play-by-play in Washington, including whether or not Republicans are going to get rid of the filibuster here on Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. The phone number is 404-872-0750. 1-800-WSB-TALK. As always, you can text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 444-999 to get the podcast on Google Play or iTunes and to get the daily show notes. Sign up and you'll be subscribed automatically. Now, let's get into the National Rifle Association before we do anything else. They have released a statement this afternoon calling for the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, now Explosives as well, the B-A-T-F-E, technically, uh, to review them whether or not they should be reconsidered. Um, In Las Vegas, this is their statement, in Las Vegas... The, um, but where do we have it? Uh, it reports indicate that certain devices were used to modify the firearms involved. Despite the fact the Obama administration approved the sale of bump fire stocks on at least two occasions, the National Rifle Association is calling on the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives to immediately review whether these devices comply with federal law. In the aftermath of the evil and senseless attack in Las Vegas, the American people are looking for answers as to how future tragedies can be prevented. Unfortunately, the first response from some politicians has been to call for more gun control. Banning guns from law-abiding Americans based on the criminal act of a madman will do nothing to prevent future attacks. That is absolutely right. Now, uh, Paul Ryan has left open the possibility that they will ban bump stocks. Uh, Carlos uh, Cabrello, who is a Florida Republican congressman, is writing a bipartisan bill to ban bump stocks. Uh, It looks like the Senate is gaining traction as well. Senator John Cornyn of Texas is willing to do this. Here's the thing, though. What Republicans intend to do is they intend to craft a specific legislation on the bump stock. They will allow Democrats in an open process to submit amendments more likely than not, which will fail, and then they will vote to ban the bump stocks. Democrats, however, seem to think they have a winning campaign issue. If the Democrats believe their winning campaign issue for 2018 is we're going to ban guns, and expand abortion rights in America. That's probably not the winning issue people are looking for, but they seem to think that it is. Uh, that in addition to all the Antifa nonsense, and, and now you've got the college students saying that liberalism is white supremacy. Look, I realize we have entered a time of madness in this country, but the National Rifle Association appears to be willing on the bump stock issue to uh, move forward with this. Uh, The fact that they're asking the ATF to look at it, you may not even need a congressional solution. You may be able to have a regulatory solution. If you have a regulatory solution or you have a legislative solution, It is a compromise step that both sides should agree on. But the problem here is it's not going to be enough for the left. The left will not settle for just banning bump stocks. And by the way, in the meantime, you're probably going to have a run on bump stocks uh, across the board. So this gets me to the New York Times and Brett Stevens today. The uh, I'm using air quotes here, conservative, more Republican columnist. At the New York Times, we'll get into that and the implications there. And Nancy Sinatra's outrageous tweets about the NRA. Okay, before I get into Brett Stevens or anything else, I want to explain the history of the Second Amendment. Uh, Because I don't think most people realize this. And liberals tend to cite uh, Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist Papers on the ability of a militia to defend the country without the need for a costly standing army. Conservatives tend to cite more ancient rights to keep and bear arms against tyranny. Um, it, behold the healing power of and, because it's both. To understand the Second Amendment, you do need to understand that our Revolutionary War founding fathers uh, were fighting a tyrannical government that was seizing the populace's firearms to prevent revolution. They came from Enlightenment ideals that God gave us our rights, not government, and that people had the right to defend those rights themselves without reliance on government. 
Now, it is true in the Federalist Papers, and it is true of the rhetoric of the Founding Fathers and letters written at the time, that one of the reasons they wanted a right for individuals to keep and bear arms was to be able to defend the government without the need for a standing army. If all of the people were armed, the government didn't need a standing army in their mind. Um, this was taken from a Swiss concept. Remember, the, the Swiss government, Swiss cannons, is one of the areas in which we modeled our federal government. And the Swiss, the right to keep and bear arms in Switzerland, went back a long way. All the people kept arms. They still do. They're trained to use them in case of invasion. Switzerland keeps its neutrality. But there is, now that that covers the liberal argument, they're right on that, but there is a conservative argument the left dismisses, and they do so at their historic peril because it is also accurate. The founders in this country, if you read their writings, there's a great book called The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution that really documents this and gets into it. Um, what they, the founders wrote in their journals, in their letters to friends, and in their private papers was that they believed themselves heirs to the glorious revolution. Uh, they believed themselves heirs to the English Bill of Rights. And if you actually read some of the letters exchanged between government ministers of Britain and our founding fathers, what you see is they viewed themselves as Englishmen. They didn't view themselves as Americans. And their original agitation and their original protests were because they thought they were Englishmen uh, with as much right to representation in Parliament and the English Bill of Rights as anyone in England. And the British government missed this and did not give their colonists that sense of Britishness or Englishness. And so that's why the founders decided ultimately to revolt. If you read the Declaration of Independence, they believed they had certain rights. They believed their government was no longer honoring and protecting those God-given rights. Therefore, they were creating a new government to protect those existing rights. Now, where did those existing rights come from? Well, they said from God, but as a more theoretical or practical matter, rather, they came from the English Bill of Rights of 1689 that was enacted after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Their grand grandfathers, in some cases, had fought in the English Revolution. It was a bloodless war. That was called the Glorious Revolution. They threw off James II and brought in William and Mary, who adhered to Parliament and ruled by the people. It was a change in British constitutional monarchy that probably has allowed the British constitutional monarchical system to stay as opposed to the French system, the Italian system, the Greek system, and others that all collapsed over time. It became a more constrained monarchy. And in the process of this, one of the things that William and Mary adhered to in the English Bill of Rights was the right to keep and bear arms by the Protestants in order to maintain a militia for the protection of the government against foreign powers and to protect the people against the crown itself. The crown had limited powers to be able to withdraw firearms from the Protestant, not the Catholic, but the Protestant populace uh, in the event of a usurper monarch trying trying to take back the rights of the people. That was there in the English Bill of Rights of 1689. It was what the Founding Fathers believed. It was what John Locke and others wrote, that we had the power to protect ourselves by arms, if necessary, from a dictatorial monarch trying to take away our God-given rights. So both are true. The Second Amendment was there for the well-regulated militia, but it was also there for the people to be able to protect themselves against their government. It was both of these things. To have a conversation about it without addressing one or the other is a falsehood, and it's what the left is doing. It's what we see with Britt Stevens in the New York Times and others today, which we will get to. And, well, if we can work it in your phone calls when we come back. It's Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. You know, I am always late to trend. I'm a big, well, I oppose trends, particularly fashion trends. You should just wear classics, uh, the fashion trend stuff. One day you're going to be untrendy if you try to keep up with all the trends. You're going to waste all your money. But I'm usually late to this stuff. And one of the things I was late to is the... Uh, who Joanne and Chip Gaines were on HGTV. All my friends were talking about them for several years before I even knew. Now, I've never actually, well, unknowingly, I think maybe once I've watched Fixer Upper. Uh, I have uh, gotten their Magnolia magazine several times. I've ordered stuff from them in the last year or so. Uh, when they were under attack last year, I guess, for why didn't they have a gay couple on or whatnot? Were they homophobic? Their preacher was homophobic. Their church came under attack. BuzzFeed, by the way, doing all this. 
Uh, they have decided to end their show. They've got uh, four kids, a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old. Uh, two boys, two girls. And they've their show is coming to an end. Uh, they're going to have one more season, and that's it. And the reason is apparently security fears. Uh, they got more and more people swinging by their house, trying to take pictures, trying to take pictures of the kids. I am so sympathetic to this. This week in New York, the number of TV shows who wanted pictures of my kids to put on TV. I had nothing doing. I was not putting pictures of my kids on TV, on national TV. Uh, they have been uh, approached in the grocery store and yelled at by crazy people. Because of me, I wasn't gonna wasn't gonna do that to them. I am so sympathetic to them uh, putting their kids first. Because you know, a lot of people these days wouldn't do that. A lot of people wouldn't put their kids first, which is amazing. But good for them for doing it. I hate it for them, um, but good for them for having the right priorities. Now, when we come back, uh, I want to get into Brett Stevens' article. There is more news coming out about the shooter, what we know and what we still don't know. And there's the, um, well, Republicans in Washington now talking about getting rid of the filibuster. Probably not the time to get rid of the filibuster, given Democratic calls for gun control. Another reminder that the filibuster is one of the last lines of defense in getting gun control. We'll get into all of this right here on WSB. Welcome back. Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. As I mentioned, Brett Stevens is the, well, he's really the Republican columnist of the New York Times. Not He's not conservative in the sense that you and I are. Uh, he is a an establishment Republican apologist, and, and I mean that term very precisely uh, if Mitch McConnell does something, um, if Mitch McConnell were to tomorrow insist on a tax increase across the board, uh, Stevens is one of the people you could probably count on to defend it. He is an apologist for the Republican establishment. He has long been a Republican establishment. In fact, he denies there's such a thing as a Republican establishment, so embedded in it uh, that he he refuses to even admit it's there. My buddy Ben Dominich actually had a very compelling debate against Brett Stevens and uh, Jim Rubin of the Washington Post where they flat out denied there was such a thing as an establishment, nor the, that they were a part of it, nor that they had anything to do in the policies they advanced with the rise of Donald Trump. I mean, Dominich ate the floor with I mean, just mopped up the floor, I guess, just to say with them. Um, but that's who he is. Now, he has some impulses of the right. For example, he's skeptical of um, the science, uh, at least the policy positions on global warming. He is very much Republican on a number of issues, uh, but uh, not on gun control. And I could have told you he was going to be soft on gun control. He's an advocate of repealing the Second Amendment. He has come out today with a column in which he specifically says we should repeal the Second Amendment. Um, at least to his credit, he admits and acknowledges that there really cannot be any major change in this country without doing so. He says that in light of uh, gay marriage, which seemed impossible a decade or so ago, that this should not be considered impossible, and that we should proceed post-haste to get rid of the Second Amendment. And it may take time. But everybody should commit their resources to doing it, he, although he doesn't want to confiscate guns, he says. He just wants to get rid of uh, constitutional protections on guns so states and the federal government can regulate them more harshly. It is nice to see people finally being honest on this side. Now, there, there's something I want to draw your attention to, and that is he is very much a mouthpiece and apologist for the Republican establishment. So if he is saying this publicly, I guarantee you there are Republican leaders in the United States who are saying it privately, but they know what would happen to them if they dared to say it publicly. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, furthering uh, Stevens' issues, he doesn't really buy into the argument that we need to defend ourselves from the government. And he really thinks that with gun violence in this country, we've got to do something. The, the problem here, and that I think the left and people like Stevens fail to acknowledge, is the constitutional history. Two, there, there's an increasing movement among these sorts of people, including I think I bet Stevens is in it, uh, who believe that our rights really come from the collective that is government instead of God. I don't know that he even believes in God, as you and I would. 
And they totally dismiss the fact that if you and I were to hand in our guns tomorrow, the bad guy's not going to hang, hand in his guns. That right there, I think, completely undermines them. At this point in this country, there are 320 million Americans and more than that number of guns owned by private citizens. In fact, the number of guns is pretty proportionate against race, uh, around races. Um, blacks, whites, Asians, uh, Hispanics all tend to be per capita about the same type of gun owners, owning the same number of guns. They're not all going to hand in their guns, particularly the poor black person uh, who is in a bad part of town who needs to defend himself in his home. And, you know, by the way, one of the things that whites did in the Jim Crow era in the United States of the South after the Civil War was they forced uh, black homeowners to give up their guns. That was one way they were able to uh, uh, oppress uh, freed black slaves was to force them to give up their guns so they could be at the beck and call of the Klan and elsewhere. We have a historic reason in this country for allowing gun ownership. The black community knows this very well. And there's no reason to get rid of it. Uh, his arguments fail. And he undermines himself by dismissing some of the core arguments. But we're going to expect more and more of this from the left. Although, you know what? With people like Nancy Sinatra, I don't know that it's going to go that far. So Nancy Sinatra, who is Frank Sinatra's daughter, has come out and called for the murder of all NRA members. That the only way we're going to get gun control in this country is if we execute all of the NRA members. Think about that for a minute. This is someone of some note, and she's getting amens, by the way, from people online. They're trying to label the NRA a terrorist organization. And now you got the famous people calling for the murder of NRA members. You know, it, it, I don't think it's a winning strategy for them in 2018 to call for the murder of, of gun owners or NRA. By the way, she did clarify she didn't mean just gun owners. She meant NRA members, which is still a great many people. I just don't think that's going to be a compelling winning argument for the left come 2018. But I do encourage them to keep it up. When we come back, we'll get into uh, the latest news on the shooter, what we know. And, and there's still a lot that we don't know about him. We will also get into uh, the Republican efforts on Capitol Hill to pass a 20-week abortion ban, which has implications for gun control. Uh, really does. Um, before that, though, I want to remind you guys on Tuesday... I will be in Lawrenceville at the Books a Million. Uh, we're going to be broadcasting the show, I do believe, there. I think we got the technicalities worked out. I don't know. Um, but I'll be there at 7, nonetheless, doing a book signing at Barnes & Noble. Um, or, and I'm, I'm sorry, not Barnes & Barnes Noble, Books a Million in Lawrenceville. There's a Barnes & Noble one coming up at some point. Um, there's Monday Night Brewing coming up as well. We'll be at their new location, which is awesome, by the way. Awesome. Uh, and uh, after the show tonight, I actually will be up in Milton uh, speaking at a dinner for foster families, uh, raising money for a great organization up there, the safety organization. Um, but when we come back, yeah, I'm going to have to drive up to Milton after this. Ugh. Uh, but I'll get there. I'll do it. Uh, I got in from New York earlier. Um, I don't know what I'm going to wear just because my luggage didn't quite show up in one piece with me um but it should be delivered to the hotel at some point uh any event when we come back um it, there's still questions about the shooter uh still concerns about him and the republicans may be ending the filibuster which will get us gun control and why that's not a good idea particularly those of you who think the democrats will do it anyway let me explain why I think you're wrong when we come back. It is nine after the hour. I'm Eric Erickson. This is WSB, the phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Um, I want to spend some time just briefly bringing you the latest on what we know and don't know about the shooter in Las Vegas. It does appear that he he was big into video poker and would make large bets on video poker machines. And some people are, are raising questions about that, uh, suggesting that he was bringing in more money than was possible with video poker, but yet attributing his income stream to video poker. 
Maybe he did. I don't know. Um, he would he would bet big, make hundred dollar bets on video poker, and in some cases win several thousand dollars a day, according to current reports. What we also know is that there is a growing belief he did not act alone. There were, if you will recall, the day of the shooting, there were witnesses who were there saying a woman passed through the crowd saying, "You're all going to die. You're all going to die." And many people believed that this woman was his girlfriend, but it turns out his girlfriend was in the Philippines, which explains the wire transfer to the Philippines. Uh, According to this woman's family, she arrived in the Philippines somewhat bewildered that her boyfriend had encouraged her to take this trip to see her family and uh, found her a cheap ticket, sent her there and then wired money to her. Uh, and uh, there are people who believe that uh, room service, for example, serve food to to women in his hotel room who were there. There is a lot we don't know. Uh, there are still a lot of questions. I mean, and we also now know that it appears he targeted aviation fuel tanks at the airport. Um, he, there were two windows that he took out in the Mandalay Bay, one pointing down to the crowd, another um pointing 2,000 meters or so, 2,000 yards, I think, actually, uh, to the fuel tanks at uh, McLaren International Airport in Las Vegas that he intended to target those as well and had rifles capable of hitting them. Uh, There's also news reports out that he had rented or had gotten hotel rooms for Lollapalooza in Chicago and was scoping out vantage points that he might have been trying to do something there as well and settled on Vegas. What we know is it appears that this individual wanted to do harm to a lot of people, which I do think does raise the question, uh, given the, the truck attack in France, where 80 some odd people were killed with this truck attack. If a man like this, a monster like this, wants to cause people harm, how is he going to be stopped? In this situation, he used guns. But if he was that committed, he we know he got a hotel room uh, for another concert in Las Vegas to scope it out. We now know he had one in Chicago to scope out a concert there. He wound up doing it in this. He, would he have would he have gotten his commercial truck driver's license and rented an 18-wheeler? And try to do something with that. I mean, there are, these are all the possibilities here, but it looks more and more like the gun control solution, sort of Britt Stevens's repeal of the Second Amendment and take away everybody's guns, would not have stopped this sort of attack. Now, the Republicans in Washington are playing with a dangerous fire when it comes to the situation and something completely unrelated, although the left sees it as very related. Lindsey Graham is introducing a 20-week abortion ban in the U.S. Senate. Now, for those of you who don't know, those of you who claim Republicans are anti-science, the science really isn't uh, up for debate here. Uh, It is very clear now that around 20 weeks, the nervous system in a baby has formed to the point that the child can process pain. Now, as you know, if you have a child... Um, with few exceptions uh, of serious injury, uh, infants don't remember their, they experience pain. They don't, they just don't have lasting long-term memories of pain, but they still feel it. And in a society that will jail people for harming a pregnant dog, uh, for harming a, a, for, for mistreatment of pregnant animals, among other things, animals in general, you would think that we would be leery of causing a child pain, even if in utero. But the abortion lobby is sacrosanct uh, on the left. It is an idol, and they are opposed to a 20-week abortion ban. You know, by the way, the, the United States has more liberal abortion law in this regard than any other country in the West. Uh, in France, which has very liberal laws in many of the Scandinavian countries as well, uh, after 15 weeks, no abortions. We're one of the few exceptions. And 
Lindsey Graham has 45 Republicans with him, so 46 total, but there's going to be a Democratic filibuster. Now, when I say this, by the way, you know, they haven't actually made anybody filibuster in the Senate in quite a while. Why don't they actually try to get someone to force a filibuster before trying to get rid of the filibuster? But that's the point. Lindsey Graham and others are suggesting, well, actually, I shouldn't say Graham is, but other senators are suggesting, including Ted Cruz, that now may be the time to get rid of the legislative filibuster. Again, though, they haven't made anybody filibuster. Why don't you make them filibuster before you threaten to get rid of the filibuster? That seems like a no-brainer to me. If they get rid of the filibuster for pro-life legislation, and here's an irony here, and I realize it, um, you will get gun control legislation, which the left says will save lives. So the right wants to get rid of the filibuster to save children, And the left will then take advantage of it in the name of saving other people from gun violence. That's what they want to do. I don't think, though, uh, that the two are the same. And I don't think Republicans should do this. Now, there are people who say that Democrats will do it. Remember, Obamacare was passed under reconciliation. They only needed 51 votes. They could not get 60 votes. So they had to restructure it for reconciliation. The Democrats have never had the votes to get rid of of the legislative filibuster. They had the votes to get rid of the judicial one, thinking they could stack the judiciary, and Republicans pulled out all the stops to punish them for it and create a backlog that they're now taking advantage of. But neither Republicans nor Democrats have ever had the will to get rid of the legislative filibuster. And, you know, for Democrats who see that, well, Republicans... They couldn't even repeal Obamacare with 51 votes, so we might as well get rid of the filibuster because they're never, ever going to be able to undo anything we do once we get back in power. Tax reform is going to be the big red flag for them and abortion. Tax reform and abortion are the two areas where the Democrats uh, should have real concerns about getting rid of the filibuster. See, and because of those concerns, I don't think they actually would ever get rid of the filibuster, which is why I think it is foolish for the Republicans to talk about getting rid of the filibuster on this. Listen, I would love for a 20 week abortion ban to be enacted, but not at the expense of mobilizing the mob to pass legislation through the Senate. The Senate's filibuster is the last stopgap to the mob passing legislation. And the mob right now wants gun control, and the mob would get gun control if Democrats were in charge of the Senate and the House without a legislative filibuster. So I don't buy it, and I hope you don't buy it either. As much as there's legislation you and I may want, desperately want, I don't think any legislation is worth getting rid of the filibuster. It is the last measure to protect conservatives from the growth of government and the infringement of rights by government. And we should not be so quickly willing to give it up to pass something that we like. Tim Murphy is resigning from Congress. Murphy's the Pennsylvania Republican who is having an affair and... Uh, It's been revealed, although a pro-life member of Congress was urging his mistress to get an abortion. You know, it it is stories like this that remind me we live in a fallen world. You, You don't need events like Vegas to remind you that we live in a fallen world. Uh, and there are bad things that happen in the world. And what is evil? You know, it. Christianity has never necessarily settled on a definition, a mutually agreed upon by all sides, all denominations definition of evil. Um, I think that ultimately what evil boils down to is the absence of God. Why do bad things happen? Uh, Because God's not there. Uh, And it's not that God is not there. He doesn't exist. Um, But evil fills a vacuum uh, in the hearts of those who do not have God. And bad things happen in that regard. Uh, That's the the Augustinian model, and that's the one I tend to to think of philosophically. The the absence of God is the devil. Uh, There's no God left in the devil. He no longer reflects the glory of God. And dwelling in the hearts of man, uh, the void that's left by the absence of God is evil. And you don't need a mass shooting for evil. You, there is evil, I mean, we are all sinners. I saw a great R.C. Sproul quote the other day that um, we are not sinners because we sin. 
we sin because we are sinners. And I think that sums it up. We live in a fallen world. Uh, one of many reasons I'm a conservative is I believe that men are sinful animals, sinful creatures, that uh, we are not our best selves if left to our default. And while there may be civic good in us and we are all capable of being civic, we are ultimately fallen creatures. And so I want as few fallen creatures in charge of me as possible, which is why I'm a conservative. Uh, I think that the liberal notion that man is always progressing to a higher plane of goodness is false. Uh, in addition to it being not biblical, I think the history of humanity, uh, leave God out of it. The history of humanity shows that uh, men in groups behave badly. And that's why we have restraints in government, and that's why we should have the filibuster. And nonetheless, when we come back, speaking of people behaving badly, Democrats are in the midst of a simmering feud over Nancy Pelosi, and we should all laugh at this, and we will in a minute. Y'all, I really have no desire to get into the Harvey Weinstein stuff, the sexual harassment. I do think it's funny that a bunch of liberals... Uh, are coming out to defend him. People who are normally on the side of the, the female victims are coming out to champion this guy as some sort of hero of women because uh, they're getting paid, just so hypocritical. Um, and I, I also, I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time tonight. In fact, this is the only time I am going to spend on the president decertifying the Iran deal. It's not happened yet. There are news reports he intends to decertify it. Uh, Congress then intends to impose punitive sanctions. The president apparently working with conservative Republicans in Congress to prepare a punitive sanctions package against Iran this week before decertifying next week. But we still don't have all the details other than we know what's happening. What I do want to talk about is Loretta Sanchez, who is a Democratic member of the House of Representatives. And she is on the leadership team in the House of Representatives, that prominent. And she is calling for a shakeup, um, that it's time for new blood. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is 77. Steny Hoyer is 78. Jim Clyburn is 77. She wants them to be new talent. Uh, her quote, we have a lot of talent on the bench, and I think we need to really help develop that talent and give people opportunity. Her words, um, it, Pelosi, of course, punching back at this, um, and it, the basically Democrats are saying Pelosi's too liberal. Now, these are a bunch of liberals who are saying this, and this this did make news today, but I would suspect we're going to see this pass away uh, fairly quickly as Democrats try to unite on this liberal front because Democrats are headed towards a real uh, war. Look at this situation in Georgia. It's a great example. You got Stacey Evans and Stacey Abrams running the Battle of the Stacey's here in Georgia. The Daily Coast, which is a very left wing site, has come out for Stacey Abrams. Stacey Evans is running on we've got to bring blue collar and middle class whites back to the Democratic Party. And she's uh, highlighting her rural North Georgia upbringing, all that uh, woman of the people sort of stuff. Stacey Abrams, who is the former House Democratic leader, is running on. We've got to build a new coalition of highly educated whites, gays and blacks uh, in cities to take back Georgia and and reassert Democratic dominance. And uh, this is a battle uh, to define the Democratic Party. And listen, I know that the media fixates on internal squabbling between Republicans. The fact of the matter is the Democratic Party is in the worst state of play it's been since the Great Depression. Republicans have made inroads in New England where the media long held Republicans could never win. Uh, they have made inroads across the nation in places they're not supposed to win in the minds of the media. And it is because as much as people may hate Republicans and as much as many people do dislike President Trump, they still like them better than Democrats. And why shouldn't they? Democrats have created existential crises for many people. For poor young black men and Hispanics, uh, their push to drive the minimum wage up to $15 an hour has put people out of work and replaced them with robots. If you're a if you're a a Christian of any sort, knowing that your business may be put out of business by an aggressive activist left for your failure to bake a cake for a wedding, uh, it, it worries you. Whether or not you can take your daughter into the bathroom at Target worries you. 
These are the sorts of problems the Democratic Party has forced onto people, and there's no sense of them letting up on any of these issues. On gun control now they're advancing, on all of these things. Bake me a cake, bigot, and give me your guns isn't a winning message for the Democrats. Oh, and let's have abortion up until the moment the child leaves the hospital. These aren't the winning issues for the Democrats, and yet they think a majority of Americans agree with them on these issues. And they push and push and push and push and push. And that's one reason, one of many reasons, related there, too, to Donald Trump getting elected. And it's only going to get worse as they push this. Nancy Pelosi, some of these Democratic leaders think, is too liberal. The fact of the matter is that the base of the Democratic Party is often Bernie Sanders territory, which frankly is more liberal than Nancy Pelosi. By the way, uh, speaking of the Democratic feuding over the direction of the party, I mean, this even gets closer to home than Stacey Evans, Stacey Abrams. The, The Atlanta mayoral race... The Democratic Party is attacking Mary Norwood as being a a closet Republican. She's always been too conservative for them. Um, It's just it's very funny. I I, I don't know any of these people. Uh, And and if you're running for mayor of Atlanta, you are a Democrat. uh, But she's not Democrat enough for them. And. For all of the talk of the media these days saying the Republican Party is unwelcoming to blacks, it's unwelcoming to Hispanics, it's unwelcoming to to you pick the class of people. Um, In fact, you had Michelle Obama uh, today, Marco Rubio needling her online, uh, saying that the Democratic Party is vastly more diverse than the Republican Party leadership. And yet you've got um, vastly many more uh, black, Latino, Hispanic, uh, Indian uh, people in government uh, who are elected as Republicans than you ever did Democrats. Uh, For the longest time, you know, Tim Scott was the only black person in the Senate until Cory Booker got uh, put in there. Uh, and then you got uh, Rubio there. You know, there are more statewide elected Hispanic Republicans than there are statewide elected Hispanic Democrats. But that th- th- let's not confuse them with the narrative. Nonetheless, um, it, this this idea that the Republican Party is unwelcoming to all these people. You know, the Democratic Party is unwelcoming to Christians. They're unwelcoming to social conservatives. They're unwelcome to gun owners. They're unwelcome to pro-life activists. Uh, They are increasingly unwelcome to blue-collar white voters. They're unwelcome to middle-class white voters. They are unwelcome to black voters who have succeeded and have moved out of cities, who are accused of engaging in white flight themselves. Um, They got their own problems, and they're so busy laughing at Republicans who are cleaning their clock that they can't see their own problems, which is one reason they keep losing. I am late to a dinner I am supposed to attend in Milton, so I have to hit the road now. Um, Nonetheless, uh, I am glad to be home, even if I do have to face traffic. Now, man, though, y'all, so there is a store in New York City I've always wanted to go to, Kitchen Arts and Letters. It is a bookstore that is a bookstore of nothing but cookbooks. Old, out-of-print cookbooks, new cookbooks, all cookbooks. It is glorious. And I finally went there last night. And I kid you not, it was a 25-minute cab ride to go from 56th Street or 54th Street where my hotel was to 93rd Street. And I was so sick by the time I left that cab, which slammed on the gas, slammed on the brake, slammed on the gas, slammed on the brake, slammed on the gas, slammed on the all the way up there. I was so sick when I got out. I did not throw up, but I came very close to throwing up. I wound up walking back to my hotel. It took an hour to walk back. I got shin splints today from walk because I was in my dress shoes too. I wasn't in uh, tennis shoes. I was in in my dress shoes, and oh my lord, my legs hurt today. Um, but I got good exercise, and I got a great, great out of print cookbook uh, on desserts, no less. <laughs> Not that I need that, but anyway, uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. And since I've been so bad at taking phone calls this week. Uh, Tomorrow, maybe we'll just have a show of just your phone calls. We'll see. Depends on the news of the day, but you guys have a great night, and say a prayer that I get up to Milton on time tonight.